LED Basic is our first example of using a module that starts to use the API or the application programming interface for the EIE development board. From firmware system, you have an idea about how the system timing works and how the system tick works. And what you'll need to get very used to is that with every module, there's a corresponding task to that module. And all of those tasks are running in that one millisecond loop. So we can guarantee that we'll get entry into our task every one millisecond. And therefore, we can base timing on that as we're using these. So LED basic, the LED task itself is doing that. And then all of our code that we're going to write is going to be in a user app. And that task as well is in the main loop, always getting that one millisecond processor time. Okay? So that's our starting point. These modules are always organized with the stuff to show you what is being used in this module. So what platform can be used and what you need to, to run it. The code that we start with, and we're always pretty much always going to start with the master code, which is a clean build of firmware. So you should always use that. Uh, I do post the solution to it. So there's no, I mean, everything is step by step in these all the time anyways. The assignments that are, are not posted anywhere. so those you have to do on your own but if you just want to jump straight to the final what my version is for how I coded this uh, based on what you see in the task here or the module you can do that okay. uh, tells you what you need to know from before so this is pretty basic we're not going to be doing too much C stuff here you just have to make sure that you understand this firmware system introduction the API interface is always defined at the top of every new module that we look at. So we've got type definitions. So there's often in any time we create a task, we'll, we'll make either enumerated types or structs that are specific to that task and kind of used globally or you need, you need to be aware of them so that you can call functions or make use of constants that are going to work with the API. So here we've got uh, two enumerated types. We've got LED number type uh, and maybe that's a bit misleading because these are actually just words. So again, these are enumerated types. So if you need to specify a particular color of LED uh, and you're using a function that we're going to see in a second, uh, like let's just look down here for a moment, you can see LED on takes the argument of an LED number type. So if you want to turn the white LED on, for example, then you type LED on and in the place of this parameter, you just put the word white and then the compiler will automatically sub that based on the enumerated type. Right now you can only use one per function call. So if you want to turn on every single LED, then you have to have a function call for all of those. You can't compound them together, something I might fix one day. This LED write type has something to do with uh, any blinking or PWM of an LED. So we can visually blink an LED so a half hertz rate, one hertz rate, two hertz rate, four hertz, and eight hertz. Eight hertz is getting pretty fast, eight times per second. That's starting to I mean, you can still see it blink, but beyond that, it gets it gets pretty blurry, and it's going to start to sort of become a PWM. Um, if it's blinking more than 30 hertz, like 30 times per second, um, probably even more than 20 times per second, that's when your eye can like it's it basically low pass filters it, and it starts to be unable to detect the individual blinking, and then it just starts to look dim. So there's a blinking function and there's a PWM function, and we use these constants for the PWM. We have 20 different steps in 5% duty cycle steps, so LED PWM 0 all the way to LED PWM 100. And of course, 100 is totally on, 0 is totally off. So there's a quick little example here. We can set up a variable of LED rate type. We can call it E current rate, so E is the enumerated type and we can set it to LED PWM5. And this is one example, and this is a little bit dangerous, and I know some people would disagree with this, but we try to document it carefully. You're allowed to increment the duty cycles. So you can do this E current rate plus plus, and that will take you from a 0% to a five, or well, I guess whatever your current duty cycle is. So in this case, PWM5, if you increment it once, then you're actually gonna be at LED PWM10. If you increment past 100, then you're going to be in an undefined state. And if you decrement past zero the other way, then you're going to be in an undefined state. So this is a little bit dangerous. And this relies on a documented statement that this enum is sequential in numbers. So that's why this works. You do have to be careful with doing things like this. I wouldn't do a production device or a customer device like this, probably, because it's a little bit 
risky. The functions that we have for LED basic are basic functions, LED on, LED off, LED toggle. I don't think we need to explain those. They're very, very simple to use. Again, you just use one LED at a time. Then the blink and the PWM, they're slightly more complicated. You still provide the same first parameter of which LED you want to do that, and then you just put in the blink rate. So you should choose one of the enumerated types that make sense. So if you're calling LED blink, you need to specify a blinking rate. And if you're calling LED PWM, then you need to specify a PWM rate. There's nothing in the compiler that is going to restrict that because they're both types. This is sort of a trade-off between the complexity of how I wanted to do this and what really is happening. So I just chose to use the same type and it's a pretty simple rule that you'll get into or that you'll get used to. There's a quick little skill check that you can see what's happening. Uh, and this is the purpose of this is to, to demonstrate how different user apps can start to conflict when you're using the same resource. So that's just a little thing to consider. Lots of different examples about how to do this. And I would I caution you to follow these steps carefully and do the order that is suggested. So we add the code, right? And you can, it says you can add any colors you want and you build it, okay? And very clearly here it says, let it run full speed and see if it does what you expect. And you're going to see in three of the cases, it should do what it expects. But in the fourth case, it probably will not. And actually, I don't know if I, I'm pretty sure I've left the firmware like this. It's not a bug that it doesn't work like that, or that how do you would expect. It's a consequence of how things are initialized. And if you aren't using the API perfectly, then something isn't going to quite work. Okay, So it's explained here and in this paragraph there and then we go on to properly initialize so just like initializing new variables you know we always do that we don't like to use things uninitialized and just because we're using an api doesn't mean that we can get away with leaving things uninitialized you technically do not know what state all of the leds in are when you start first boot up the board even though you can look at it but that doesn't mean that as this progresses and your, you know, if your task is inside of a system, you'd always want to make sure you start in a known state. So in this case, you know, all of these LEDs in the off state, all of these LEDs in the on state, and then specifically what these two LEDs are supposed to do. So the purpose of this exercise uh, is not only to get used to using the API functions for LED basic, but it's also then to prove and sort of connect the idea of the firmware system and the one millisecond timing tick to be able to manually blink LEDs based on that timing. So yeah, we have API functions to blink, but I want you to use the system timing to demonstrate that you can see what needs to happen and how the system works to make use of the timing that's built in. Okay, So we're going to build a counter and it's just a four bit counter. You can do more bits if you want to do more bits. This also demonstrates using bit masking. So we talked a little bit in the at the beginning of doing bitwise logical functions uh, and that's related to this concept of masking. So you're essentially um, kind of just isolating individual bits and looking at their state of them as the as this counter is running and that is going to allow you to decide which LED to turn on, right? Because you have, if you're using a four bit counter, so you're gonna count from zero to 15, and in binary is what we're showing on the LEDs, then anywhere from zero to four of those LEDs are gonna be on based on the bits that are currently in your counter, right? So this is starting to make you look at a super low level, make you understand what's happening in your code, what's happening in the memory of the processor, and then how to access that memory and then apply it to something real, to apply it to turning LEDs on. That's what we're going for here, right? So work through that carefully. Uh, do one at a time, right? You don't have to write all this code at once. Um, write small things, build them, compile them, make sure that they work, and then if they are working as expected, then it makes sense to either copy and paste or and it's better right now to type it out. Um, I, I would really suggest that you type all of these. You can cut and paste this, but you need to get familiar. You're, remember, you're learning a new language, not just C, but also the language of EIE, the language of our system. So if you're just copying and pasting, then you're not going to get used to that. You're not going to get used to our style. You're not going to get used to how the editor works. And so you're not really 
gaining that skill. So take the time to type these things out. I do copy variable names all the time because I don't really like typing them, but I will, you know, I would type all of this stuff out and just paste in my variable name as I as I put it in there. Okay. Make sure you understand what this is doing, right? What what does that function actually do to enable me to decide if I should turn the orange LED on in this case? There's a few other things we can do uh, with a backlight color. So the backlight's cool because it's an RGB LED, red, green, blue LED, which means we can make any color that we want. And when we mix those colors together, then we can create other colors. So very simply, if you just turn on these LEDs, uh, according to this, which is essentially a truth table, then you can get all these colors out. Now you can't get orange because you need to actually modulate down one of these colors. And I think you have to turn down green a little bit uh, to be able to get an orangey color. So if you want to try that, you can. The easy ones to make are just using these discrete on and off of red, green, blue, and you can get all of these seven colors here. Okay, so try that out, and we just go through the different sequence and you can see how that works and there's instructions here this is note that this is for the dot matrix board the leds are are different set up there so this module applies to both so you can skip this section head down to the bottom and there's a couple of challenge exercises here and then of course there are an assignment to do and a few little challenges i'd like to see everyone create a really nice custom led pattern that's going to be their own um, and we can probably keep this in a user app you could you could separate this out to another task that's your blinking led or something like that that you might use in the future when you do some of the other assignments so i want to continue to build things so I, I would like you to set this up so you can use that in the future and that's it i think it's pretty straightforward you're just the main part right now is to get used to this API, get used to how these functions work and start using them. Remember you're writing all of your code in user app. So I like to set up my screen like this. So I've got my user app.c open and I split the window. I can work in user app initialize up here. I can turn off that breakpoint because I just clicked it. And I can work with my state machine down here. And, I mean, you can do this however you want. I'm showing IAR version 8, but version 7 works the same way with splitting screens. And I've got user app.h open on this side. Uh, if you're putting numbers in, like if you, you know, if you're counting to 500 or something like that, I do recommend that you do a, a define constant. So you'd say counter limit, for example, and make sure you always typecast these things properly so that there's no confusion about what it is um, and you should put it a comment in here as well about what that what that number is doing um, and I don't think I did that in the example I should have because we it's really nice for kind of a self-documenting thing to, to have these numbers in there and then if you decide if you want to go faster then you just change it in your header file rebuild your code and there's a good chance that you're going to use this at least in two or three different locations so if it's hard coded as a value then you have to go through and find all of those things that's a pain if you specify it here with a define and then use this in your code then you can change it in a single spot it documents itself on what it is and it makes your code a lot easier to use. Okay? But these are all the things that you're going to start to get used to as you're going through these modules. Alright, good luck!